Kenyan cows are said to produce over 3.5 billion litres of milk a year, with Kenyans consuming more milk than people in any other African country. And the demand for dairy products is still on the rise. This is Mula Insider, where we are all about personal finance and your relationship with money. My name is Masi Milanoi, and this week we take a look on what it takes to do dairy farming. And remember to watch our previous episodes on www.mula.co.ke and link with us on our social media pages. First, let's take a look at the highlights in business this week. Safaricom half-year net profit to September rose by 12.1% to 37.05 billion shillings, with M-Pesa revenues driving the rebound on account of end-to-free state-backed transactions to support customers during the COVID-19 period. The results, covering six months from April to September 2021, also saw voice and messaging revenue increase in the period that coincided with the lifting of COVID-19 restrictions. In view of this uh, and expansion to Ethiopia, we expect earning before interest and tax, as you can see on the screen, in financial year 2022 to be in the range of 97 to 100 billion and CAPEX, which is capital expenditure, to be in the range of Kenya shillings 70 to 73 billion, inclusive of Ethiopia. On an underlying basis, excluding Ethiopia, we revise our earning before interest and, and tax guidance given uh, back in May 2021 from Kenya shillings 105 to 108 billion to the range of Kenya shillings 107 to 110 billion and maintain the CAPEX guidance given before at Kenya shillings 40 to 43 billion for financial year 2022. Let's take a look at key financial highlights of the results. And the Capital Markets Authority has granted licenses to HFM Investments Limited and Winsome Markets Kenya Limited to operate as non-dealing online foreign exchange trading brokers, lifting the number of entities in this space to six. In a statement released to Newsroom, the CMA Chief Executive Officer Wycliffe Shamia noted the authority is pleased to grow the pool of licensed entities that can offer non-dealing online foreign exchange trading trading services to investors. The first intermediary in this space was licensed in 2018 and since then there have been five additional licenses. The licenses were issued pass on to the Capital Markets Authority Cup 485A and the Capital Markets Online Foreign Exchange Trading Regulations of 2017. As non-dealing online foreign exchange brokers, the entities are licensed by the authority to act as a link between the online foreign exchange market and a client in return for a commission or markup in spreads. The licenses to engage in marketing making activities, buying and selling of foreign currencies. However, they will provide their clients with access to trading platforms, enabling them to trade from anywhere and at any time using their electronic devices. And finally, Faolo Microfinance Bank has recorded sales worth 327 million shillings this year. This marked a 31% growth compared to a similar period last year. Faulu, a subsidiary of UAP Old Mutual Group, a diversified listed financial services firm, also posted an increase in income and commissions from its bank assurance agency. Faulu Bank CEO Apollo Njoroge attributed the significantly improved performance in the bank assurance agencies to enhanced operational efficiency, convenience and speed of service due to automation of the process. 
Now to our top story of the week, dairy farming is one of the largest contributors to food and nutritional security and a source of livelihood in Kenya. This is also driven by the continuous demand for milk and milk products. According to the Kenya Dairy Board, over 72 million litres of milk was consumed in September alone. However, to get into the business, experts advise that you first need to have the food before bringing the cows to the farm. Take a look. For somebody beginning, what is most important first is um, uh, it is beginning with feed and not beginning with cows. If you're able to begin with fodder first, planting fodder, and I'm assuming that already the viability examination has been done and it's a go for that investment. It, it is not starting to test whether it's going to be viable. Already the viability has been tested and proven positive on paper. Then they begin with fodder, then they go to the structures, then they go to the equipment and the workers. Then cows come to a farm that is already set up. So the mistakes I find, and that's where I would say that uh, lack of know-how has led to collapsing of dairies, is where somebody begins with a, a structure and cows, then begins to think about where the feed is going to come from. Most common cow that Kenyans have gone for is a Frisian. Because we are not able to do what we call a, a, a genetic audit, it's difficult to know whether it's Holstein Frisian or whether it is half Frisian and half something else. But let's say black and white cow is very common. You'll also find um, uh, the red Frisian, you'll find Eschers, you'll find uh, also uh, Jassies are also becoming very popular nowadays because there are people who are going for um, they are going for, they, they want to do the farming itself, they also want to do a bit of processing and because they are doing solid products, then the butter fat becomes a, a concern and instead of uh, pushing a friction to give you higher butter fat, then they go for cows that give you less milk and uh, higher butter fat. Another reason why smaller cows are also getting preferred is because of the uh, feed intake. There are people who are going for smaller cows because they eat less and therefore they can be afforded by the person who is uh, uh, owning that farm. So they don't want a cow taking 25 kgs of feed in terms of dry matter. They want a cow taking about 15 or 12 because they can afford that. And then they accept the amount of milk that cow produces. And then also the issue of structures. Bigger cows require high, higher investments in terms of uh, sleeping comfort. When you go to a farm that has bigger cows, when they use mats, you can see that uh, they're having wounds on the hocks, on the knees, and they have dirty, uh, dirty legs or dirty udders because that cow is heavy and the pressure points are pressing too hard on the bedding. So there are people who are going for other breeds of cows because of managing the comfort and managing the feeding. People go for um, what we call advanced pregnancy hypha. Now for Frisian, it will depend. If the farm has very good documentation, has a good reputation, and the mothers have a high production of milk, there are farms selling up to about 400,000 Kenya shillings per hypha. Now, I would say the top range breeds, we are having about um, between 330,000 shillings to about 350,000. In most cases, those are cows that are, were imported as calves or they imported directly as pregnant hypha's from Europe or from South Africa or from other dairy developed economies. However, if you buy from a farmer who has very good looking cows, but they have no documentation, so you cannot be able to confirm the parentage, you can't confirm the top production of the mother, uh, the documents are not very good, but you, can, but you like the cow in terms of the size, the outlook, and uh, the growth schedule, you can see it, was, uh, it didn't stand in terms of growth, then in most cases, you're going to buy that cow between 180,000 shillings up to around 250,000. So that we can call it a second tire costing, 250 to between 180. Now, when you see someone selling a very good hypha, Frisian hypha below 180, in most cases, they have a reason, uh, they have an, an emergency, or they, for some reason, they have a cash flow problem which they need to solve, so they end up selling nearly at cost. Because if you go, if you go at, to, the, to the costing of how that hypha grew from the calf, all the way to the first, pregnancy, uh, to the first calving, which is between 
between 23 and about 27 months from birth, then that heifer in a system which is intensive, she has probably costed the owner about um, 180,000 shillings to about 240, depending on the feed cost, which is rising. So when they now go to cost based on, to cost the selling price or to decide the selling price based on the cost of production of that heifer, it is most likely going to be above 240,000 shillings. Small farmers will really sell cows between each other. You can have heifers as low as 90,000 shillings to 120. And that is now the third tire level. Capital estimation, these are the major things. The structure, the structure cannot be ignored. It goes between um, about, uh, uh, yeah, if you're using wood, mixing with a bit of metal, metal because of the feedlocks and the cubicles, um, some, some, some specific details where you can use um, metal, but then maybe you're using wood for the pillars and for the roofing, then it can, the cost can really come down. For people who use all wood, and maybe the wood is theirs, they didn't buy, the cost can come really down. But perhaps the lowest you can get to is about 40,000 shillings per cow space. But we have barns that have gone to about, up to about 200,000 per cow space. That means, when I say per cow space, it means that I divide the total cost of that barn by the number of cows it was designed to hold. So if, and I'm talking about mature animals. So if I was designing a barn for 100 cows and it has cost me 2 million shillings, then you divide 2 million by 100 animals. Then that's what, when I say these terminologies like uh, per cow space, that's a very nice way of looking at, at the capital or the cost of that structure. So it can, it can range. The other one is fodder and feeds. Um, growing of the fodder or whether you're buying it, that's a major part of uh, capital. Feeds, you could be making it to yourself, it doesn't matter. If you're buying complete feeds or you're mixing at your farm, if you're buying fodder, if you're growing it at your farm, whichever way you look at it, there's a cost to it. And then there is um, the cows now. So we have the cows and the feed and then the, the structure. Those are the major costs. Now we have the other softer cost, but they are also, they have to be put in there. The workers, the equipment. Hey, I don't think equipment is a small cost because it will depend. If you are calling a milking parlor an equipment, a milking parlor like semi-automatic, mechanical, uh, where people are just putting clusters into the teats and then milking is happening and milk flows into the lines, goes to the tanks. That's, a, that's an expensive equipment. It could actually go to the cost of the, of the barn. If the barn costs you six million, you can have a parlor at six million. So it's not a cheap equipment. Then the tanks, you're talking about the, the, the milking, other milking uh, equipment like the buckets and everything. Then you also have the, the power, the energy, which is not part of the structure, but they have to be brought in. The backup power, the, maybe the generators, you have freezers, you have coolers. So let's say in the milking, after milking, what you need after that to keep the milk okay, the pasteurizers and so on, that can also be very expensive. And all this equipment must be foreseen so that you're not thinking about them when, you're already, uh, when the day, day is already beginning. We have two types of record keeping. We have what we call production records and we have what we call financial records. For production record, what is important is a milking record, uh, very important. Nearly every farmer has that because that is, the, that is what they use to reconcile how much they were paid and how much milk they produced. Then you have, you have the, the health record. The health record is a very important one because everybody who treats cows has to indicate which diseases, which cow, what uh, antibiotics I gave or what medicines I gave and uh, whether the cow is healed or, or the cow has not survived. Then we have the, the, the breeding record, another very important record. When I mentioned to you about the price of a heifer, farms that are able to record the parentage of a cow, who was a mother, who was a father, uh, when was she born, how long was she growing up to first, uh, first insemination, up to first calving, that kind of KPI are maintained in the breeding record. And there you indicate right from birth, when the cow has given birth, is it a half a, half a calf, a bull calf, and then all the way. And then we have also what we call the calf, register, calf weight register. The calf weight register checks, monitors the weight of the calf from birth. After she is weighed at birth, then how is she increasing? It is used to calculate the weight gain on a daily basis. How much weight is she gaining? And on that, that we are able to know, uh, should we change the ration? 
Is the calf growing well? Is she sick? Because the weight gain can be able to be a good indicator of healthy growth. And then um, uh, we've talked about uh, milk record. We have the calf weight register. We have the breeding record and the health record. Now, we have now the non-production record, which are more financial records. This is where now you register the costs and the revenues of the farm. So if an accountant came to your farm or you have a, a stay-in accountant or a clerk, they're able to check the expenses and the revenues and I can be able to say what is the operating profit or margins for that farm. There are some cooperatives who are now processing. They have started processing their own milk. That also becomes a market for their own farmers and they can be able to push that milk all the way to the market and they're able to tell farmers we can be able to get a good price because our yogurts are going or whatever else they are making from that milk or the mala or fresh milk. Then you also have uh, groceries or milk bars or milk ATMs. Those are people who are basically uh, putting up on the street and selling milk directly. It could be owned by the farm or they could be supplied by a farm. That's also a good market. And then uh, we have also seen farms who have, uh, like this one now, who have their own processing. So they have the, pr the primary production section, but they also have the secondary production section, which is the um, processing. So milk comes from this as a, as a separate business unit and moves to the other business unit. The cubicles must be the same size in terms of cow can fit in and when, when sleeping and also coming out. And when she lies down, she's not being pressed by the ground. It is also comfortable to lie on. It can be sand, it can be maram, it can be some special kind of swell that can be turned over. But for smaller cows, also mats works, work very well. But what we are saying, where she sleeps, she must be able to press a bit by her weight instead of being pressed against by a hard ground. That's very, very important. And then from there, we're talking about the watering area. Where are they taking their water? There has to be a place where they can be able to reach the water without any issues with access, uh, with accessing that water. Water can be available, but maybe between where she is and where the water is, there's a bit of a hard ground where she cannot step. Now, we try to maintain their hooves for as long as possible. Because lameness is one of the reasons why we are culling cows out of the farm, because they are lame. But if we have a very good ground for them, then they live longer, they can give us milk longer. While you are watching Mula Insider and remember to check out our website www.mula.co.ke for more stories and link with us on our social media pages. Coming up is another exciting episode of Pursuits. Like any other venture, daring farming can be quite capital intensive. One of the ways of covering your cost is taking a loan. Experts advise that you need to have continuous conversations with your bank, especially when you're not able to pay back on time. This is to ensure that your financial CV is well maintained with the lenders. What banks will mostly look for is if you are listed negatively. And the negative listing is the one under an unperforming loan. The minute they see you're listed negatively, then your loan application stops. If the four of you came with the same exact salary, you may not all get the same amount of money. Why? Because of one, your spending habits. Uh, also, what else do you have? What other obligations do you have outside? Once you get paid, some of us have other obligations. I'm already investing some money with old mutual for instance which then means i have a, a, a certain amount i must remit to old mutual every month which then means that money is now not available towards a loan repayment uh, there's someone else who has a credit card already which then means there is a certain amount of money they have to send to the credit card company which also reduces their disposable income when we come to your profile you should be able to see all the borrowings that you have undertaken in this market and then see performance, which means that uh, that performance then enables us to calculate your risk profile in terms of uh, accessing credit. Also, not having no credit is also not good for you. So someone straight from school or who is on their first job and they've never borrowed. They will not necessarily have a bad score, but they will not have the best score. 
because we have no history on you. We don't know anything about you. Your clean slates, we are yet to figure you out. Your credit report or your information on your credit bureau is very much like your CV. It's just that this CV is for you to be able to access credit. Remember, the most important thing when you're checking, when you're giving a loan, you have to verify that this person has ability to pay this loan for the period you've given them for. So banks will lend to you or give you a rate that reflects your risk profile. So somebody with a score of 600 will not get credit at the same rate with somebody with a score of 800. Banks now are required to report both the good loans and the bad loans. In the report, there will be performing loans. Performing loans are all the loans you've taken and you have not missed a payment. Then there is loans now that were non-performing but have been closed. For instance, I took a loan. I paid nicely for six months. Then I ran into trouble. I wasn't able to pay, so I was listed. Listing now is being reported as a defaulter. When do you, by the way, get reported to a credit reference bureau for not paying? Is if you've not paid your loan for 90 days. In terms of what defined as a default in banking is 90 days. If you run through those missed payments for 90 days, if it's monthly, it means you have missed three installments, then now you go into default. You've gone into default. And that your record now changes from being in the performing list to the default list. The regulations are very clear. So if there was any default, that default information is kept there for five years from the date you completed paying it, stating that at one point you had taken a facility and that facility went into default. Well, now you know how to maintain a good relationship with lenders and to make sure that your financial books are in check. For now, let's take a look at the leading indicators this week, starting off with the stocks and foreign exchange. Let's take a look at the best prices of basic commodities this week across selected supermarkets. Well, that's all we had for you this week on Mula Insider. Remember to also check out our website www.mula.co.ke for more stories and link with us on our social media pages. And remember, if you're doing dairy farming, start with the food, then the cows. My name is Masi Milanoi. See you next week. <music> <music>